life hit me like a brick road, I think, quicker than most. A lot of people look at my age and are like, dude, you're so successful for your age. I've been trying at this for the last 10 years. They're not escaping the pain, they're more going towards the reward. It's easier to run from the pain than chase after something you don't really know how it feels. You've pretty much grown up having tasted the worst of the worst. Once you taste both sides of life, you know which side tastes better. Now, it doesn't ultimately mean that one life is perfect versus the other. What's the story that you're really telling? And I think Pudgy Penguins is helping shape that trend. People look to Pudgy Penguins and be like, well, the clear leaders in the space. It is arguably top three biggest announcements in NFTs ever made, ever. I'm sure you have a lot of conversations happening behind the scenes, but what's next? What I find more interesting than the actual success story of a lot of the entrepreneurs, you've recently had your fair share, you've uh, you've turned Pudgy into the success story it is today, and you are single-handedly reshaping what the Web3 business model looks like. But what I'm most curious about a lot of time is the origin story. What is it that led to the character behind the brand to be shaped the form you are today? And one thing you often talk about that I've heard you speak a lot is how your upbringing led to you having the character that you had today, the drive that you have today. So that's something that I wanted to dive in with you today. Uh, Luca, what did your upbringing look like? I think when you, you know, the, the brief version about my upbringing is I grew up homeless with my mom. Uh, she was an illegal immigrant. We were in uh, LA for, you know, we ended up settling down in LA and I grew up with a pretty bad crowd. Um, and I was forced to kind of be independent. So I think there's a slew of things that I think, you know, made me who I was. Uh, one of that was probably the independence. I was 12 years old skateboarding until 9 PM in downtown LA, you know, 10 miles from the house. I guess I just matured quicker. Uh, life hit me like a brick road, I think quicker than most. And a lot of people look at my age and are like, dude, you're so successful for your age. And I tell them, I'm like, look, I've been trying at this for the last 10 years, right? I've been an entrepreneur since I was 15. I dropped out of school when I was 16. Uh, and I've been giving this a crack since pretty much uh, uh, 10 years now. And so, you know, w what I think it taught me, I think it taught me not to give up. Uh, it taught me stress tolerance, which I think is probably the most important. Uh, I've been very stressed throughout my life. And uh, anything that happens today is just nothing but a bump in the road. It doesn't break me the same way that I think it might break other people. Uh, I understood the duality of life because being homeless didn't mean we were pushing carts. We were staying in guest bedrooms and couches. And some of those homes that we stayed in were multi-million dollar homes. Other homes were in the worst ghettos in the, in, in America, but you know, other homes were in the best, uh, towns in America. Hamptons was one. We lived in the Hamptons for like 18 months and that was a great life. Uh, and so I, I think it just, it just kind of taught me what I wanted. It taught me, I think, perspective, uh, tons of different households, tons of different religions, tons of different ethnicities, uh, in which I was living amongst. Uh, and I think it just, um, it just matured me. If you were to consolidate it all, uh, I just matured quicker than most, I believe. I think a lot of people have this, uh, weird impression of life that's kind of, uh, gated from what I think reality and, uh, I had no other choice but to realize and live in reality. And uh, I think that made me who I am today. Take me through the emotions that you're feeling back then. Did you, first of all, understand that the circumstances you were in were not the normal circumstances that a kid at 12, 13, 14 would be in? And how would you describe the emotions you were going through? Back then. Yeah, once I was 10, I realized I think up until that point, I, I hadn't. It felt kind of normal. Uh, uh -huh. I... I grew up clinically angry. I mean, unbelievably okay. angry and really, because my mom never really, we, we, we got a home, but she never really found any financial success ever until I basically was able to take care of her. I mean, dude, every, even though we had our own home every month, it was bank account went to zero, Amex went into debt and it was just like figuring it out. And so as I got older, it began to frustrate me more and more. And the straw that broke the camel's back is when my mom Airbnb'd the house. And so the house was a one bathroom house. Uh, you know, when somebody's airbnb it, it becomes a hostel. Uh, you know, you can't, you're, you're, I'm at this point, I'm 15 years old. I'm like, a, you know, on the precipice of being a man. I have a girlfriend and I can't just, you know, I, I can't do anything. And this, this for me was rough. This was like, this, this drove me nuts because it came down to the point where I had to go outside to go use the bathroom and like, just go like, I just couldn't, they couldn't, there's no home. There's no safe, there was no safe space. So let's go back to school and then come to a hostel and then just be a member in the hostel. Uh, and my mom did it to pay the bill. And so at the end of the day, you know, I, I 
give her all the credit in the world because even if I was in her shoes, I don't know how she did it and how, how we ended up uh, not actually being in shelters and being homeless. So I have so much respect and uh, for what she did and what she was able to do for my brother and I. Uh, but ultimately, I, I was unbelievably angry. My, my teenage years, me and my mom hated each other. Um, and then it wasn't until I made it that like we rekindled our relationship. And uh, now it's been it's never been stronger. But um, I, I was really, really angry is the best way to describe it. Anger can lead to two things. It can lead one to become aggressive in the sense where you don't want it or one where it, it puts them in a zone where they have to transform the situation they're in. For you, man, like why would you say, considering that you were surrounded by not the best crowd, considering that you were often moving cities, perhaps you weren't able to foster a deep, meaningful relationship with the people around you. The obvious normal outcome for someone, if someone was to look at perhaps 12-year-old Luca, it would be an easier bet to say that this kid would probably turn into a drug dealer than he would into a successful entrepreneur. What would you say were the struck of luck or the cards that you were dealt that led you going to this path instead of that one? That's a good one. Uh, and just it, for the sake of honesty, uh, that was the path I was going down. I grew up, uh, you know, this not known, but I was a pseudo gang member, gang affiliated. I mean, that's just, that's just, you, you don't see it today, but like, hey, I, I, it, I was a product of my environment. I think we all are. And the environment that I was in was a desperate one. You bring up an interesting point. Uh, you know, anger is a powerful fuel. It's not the best fuel, but it's a really powerful one. And you can either let that, that, let that fuel blow you up uh, and, and crush you, or you can leverage that fuel in the right direction. The person that doesn't get enough credit, that is probably one of the most important people in my life, is my brother and I have two different dads. So I have an older brother of five years. His dad always stayed in the picture. My dad jumped ship. He was a coward. And so the his name is Tim. And so Tim always played a role in my life. And Tim was the guy who, you know, ex-professional tennis player, you know, had a good network, always brought us around the right people. So the, the thing that I thought was really important for me that is kind of an X factor for me is I had a North Star of who I wanted to be and where I wanted to go. And it wasn't necessarily through Tim, but it was through the people, Tim's friends and his network and the people that we would spend in the houses on weekends. And so I wasn't, I had like this on the weekday, I had this like, weird life plagued with like graffiti and skateboarding and drugs and fighting people, right? Just like hooliganism. Uh, but on the weekends, I almost transformed into this new life every other weekend. I go hang out with Tim if he was in town and then he would expose me to the life that I wanted, you know, guys that own the Lakers, guys that own some of the biggest property. Cause you know, tennis is a, an affluent sport. So he's out here, you know, playing tennis with some of the biggest and best in the city Uh, you know, Jimmy Goldstein is one, and, you know, guys that just like, you know, are, are the creme de la creme and, and the top of the totem pole uh, in just life, at least life in Los Angeles. And so I just, I saw that and I was like, dude, you know, the, the beauty about LA is all you got to do is turn north to the Hollywood Hills and see what you want, right? You don't, you can be in the deepest ghettos in Watts or, you know, South LA, and all you've got to do is find a place, you know, top of a rooftop. And all you got to do is look north to the most prestigious real estate with the most prestigious groups of people living on that mountain. I thought that was important for me that like I knew I also was, you know, throughout my hooliganism, I found a friend who had an affluent family. He ended up being my best friend. His name was Dylan. He kind of brought me out of this like hoodlum mindset because uh, I was very much a hoodlum. Uh, I was I was just not on the right path. And so he kind of brought me to the valley. And so the valley kind of showed me this new world of just like, okay, not this just hooliganism that I've been growing up with for the last five years. And I think that just exposed me once the thing that's really important is once you taste both sides of life, you know, which side tastes better. Now it doesn't ultimately mean that one life is perfect versus the other. Uh, I can tell you today in a position where I probably accomplished my wildest dreams that it's still not fulfilling the way that you think it might be, but It's about the pendulum and one side of the pendulum is really bad. And I have a lot of empathy for people that are growing up in those situations that are dealing with those situations. And the other side of the pendulum is better. Uh, it's not the all and be all, but it's a better life. And so 
that I it was it was that taste. I I I wasn't foreign to what I wanted. I think the problem with a lot of people is they have never felt it before. But if you can feel it, even for a couple days, even for a week, even for a month, you'll know that there's just no way you want to go back to you know. I had this thing where I would stay at Dylan's house. He had this beautiful multi million dollar house. I would basically live at his house. And on weekdays, I'd go back to this hostel, and on weekends, I'd go to this paradise. And I was like, dude, I just want to stay in paradise. So my brain started being wired, like optimize, like what do you have to do to get paradise? Because the hostel is not cutting it. it. It felt like you know hell on earth, even though I'm fully conscious that people have way worse lives than I did. This is just how I felt in the moment when I was that age. Man, you bring up a really interesting point, which is that very often consequences are a much better teacher than reward. And for you, you've pretty much grown up having tasted the worst of the worst. So what your reference point was getting as far away from that as possible versus most people who grew up, I would say in the middle for them, they are going for the reward, but not going. They're not escaping the pain. They're more going towards the reward. Yeah, and it, and it's easier to run from the pain than chase after something you don't really know how it feels. That's a good sentence. So today, how would you describe your default emotion? If you used to be a very angry kid, what, what would you say you are today? My entrepreneur answer would be grateful. Okay. Uh, my real answer would be life is just hard, no matter where you go, no matter where, like just problems erode. So. I have this thing where I guess I'm in this like purgatory, this like limbo in between, like, I just love to work and I, I love to, I just, I, 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 my brain is programmed strangely. Like I'm the type of person where I have like childhood friends that I love that I just don't talk to because I'm just focused. I'm, I'm just obsessed with, with this giant igloo behind me. And so I don't, I don't, it almost doesn't leave room for other emotion outside of the emotion that that, that, that the brand gives me whether it's positive or negative, right? If something negative happens in the brand and I'm feeling like shit, if something positive happens in the brand and I'm feeling positive, it's like I'm almost correlated to this giant igloo and this pudgy penguin. Uh, but if there's ever a moment where I feel negative, I try to put myself in a place of gratitude because at the end of the day, dude, I'm 25. And if you'd have told me this would have been in my life 20, when I was, when I was 15 or 16 or 17 or 10, I would tell you, man, I would be so grateful and I'd be so happy. And so I live in this moment of gratitude, but There's also this thing where like, I don't want to be too like stuck in gratitude because like, I, 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 I need to go further. Like this is not the end for me. This is not the moment of bliss and perfection. So I still have that North star, but I, I would say my, my emotions are unfortunately correlated with how I feel like the brand is doing and what the stress of the brand is feeling because my life is just, dude, I live and breathe this pudgy penguin. And then I think on the other side of the spectrum is if I ever do feel really bad, uh, I put myself in a place of gratitude. What would you want to be remembered as, Luca? I want to be remembered as somebody who really helped people and changed the world, as corny as that sounds. Like I have a purpose here and I know to achieve my purpose, I need to get, a, I need to create a really big legacy and I need to get a big win in business. Um, but ultimately, dude, I, I cannot wait for the day where I have the reputation and the money to just go and just help people and animals. That's all I want to do. I, I have a passion, which is music. And I think I can help a lot. I think music helps people more than, than I think music gets its credit for. Uh, music personally saved my life. Uh, and so whenever the Pudgy Penguin chapter ends, if it ever ends, uh, I would go into music and I would go into helping single moms And I would go into helping animals the best way I can and, and, and maybe solve a big problem like waste or, or, you know, there's obviously ways, you know, there's, there's a lot of ways that you can kind of so help solve these problems. But the, the, the underlying realization that I came to Leon, and I think it's an important one is you and I are both going to die one day. And uh, that's just what's going to happen. And, and the common denominator with everybody listening is we're all going to die. And uh, it might sound like a pessimistic take, but it's just the truth. And I'd rather sit in my reality. And with death, a, a looming a looming fact and a looming moment that will happen to all of us, what is the meaning of life? Well, the, the meaning of life can't be about me because I'm just going to die, right? And so what is the meaning of life? I think it's just impact. Like, what can you do for the rest of the world? Like, what can you do to make the world a better place? And then just create that chain reaction, right? That's what legacy is. Legacy is the beginning of a chain You know, hopefully in a perfect world, 
Uh, I, I sit in the history books for thousands of years. I'd have to accomplish something really great to do that. But I'm, I'm interested in, in my name catching wind. I'm interested in my bloodline never having to struggle ever again. Uh, and I'm interested in, you know, sitting back on my deathbed. And as I take my last breath, thinking to myself, man, this world is a better place because I came into it. And if I can accomplish that, then uh, that, that, that would be fulfilling for me. And uh, ultimately, my purpose is just that. And I, and, I, and I think we're playing a role in that purpose with Pudgy Penguins. If you, if you just look at the brand and the positioning of the brand, the brand is there to help people. And I told the team this, or I don't really tell them this because obviously they're business partners and I want to see them win. But God forbid it all, all else fails and, and I don't make it out of the other side of this, which I have every intention to. Uh, at least this brand made people feel better and it made people feel good. And, and, and that is something that I'm proud about. Man, you reminded me of a beautiful quote that I heard, which says that uh, true hell is when you die and you meet yourself, you meet who you could have been. And you notice that you are but a mere shadow of who you could have been. That is hell. And heaven is dying and meeting who you could have been and seeing yourself staring back at you. That is heaven. So between where you are today, Luca, and where you have the potential to become the impactful Luca that is going to leave a legacy behind, there's a canyon. And the only way to fill that canyon is by learning and acquiring new skill sets. The guy across the street that is more successful than me, I like to believe, has only been doing what I've been doing for a lot longer. He's acquired the skills that I do not possess through education and through doing. So for you, Luca, what would you say are the series of skills that you need to develop over the coming years to build Pudgy into becoming that multi-billion dollar, perhaps trillion dollar company down the line? Well, you're asking all the right questions, Leon. I appreciate it. I'm, uh, I always enjoy an interview where somebody mixes it up. These are thoughtful questions, so I'm grateful for, for you interviewing. Um, it's one of my greatest superpowers, but also my greatest weakness. Uh, is my emotional scale. Uh, if you guys, you can hear it in my voice. It's not a, I can't fake it. Uh, I'm either super passionate. I super believe I'm super happy. I'm super ecstatic, but I also flay that also goes to the, the, the flip side of it. I'm also super angry and I can get super upset. Right. And so balancing my emotions better being on a more stable line, I think is really important. Uh, the second one is I probably need to season myself a little better from a technicality standpoint. I'm a high school dropout, no college education. So there's obviously some things that I don't like being in the room and not having as good of a, I don't need to have the best finger of the pulse, but I need to have a good finger on the pulse. And there's a couple things like, you know, maybe financial projections that I might not be, you know, I, instead of being in the middle of the room, like a seven out of 10, I'm like a five out of 10. So maybe I need to get a little more technically savvy. Yeah, I, I think I think those two problems, if you encompass all of my issues, those two, if I could really master them would solve it. Uh, I could say things like 24 hour rule and just be a little more smart in how I respond. But like, that's all all goes back to my emotions. It's, it's my greatest superpower, but also my greatest weakness, right? I can, it's what's gotten me this far. Uh, but it's also what's maybe prevented me from getting further. Uh, and so I, I need to be able to utilize it when I need it. And I need to be able to, you know, turn it down when it's a, at a negative effect. And I'm getting better, uh, especially Pudgy Penguins. Has, it made me realize that because this is not the, this is not the business where you can have emotional instability. Uh, so if anything is, is programmed me for the better, it's this. You've mentioned once on the spaces we were uh, on that one of the your ability to spot trends and quickly hop on new opportunities is one of the leading uh, factors that allowed you to to see what was happening with Web3, see Pudgy as this undertapped giant, that had, this dormant giant that had all this, this potential. Can you expand a little bit more on that specific, that ability to understand and see trends? How did you develop that? And how can someone perhaps listening to this marketer, builder, uh, how can they develop that instinct that you had? You know, it's an interesting one because it's an instinct. And I think you either you sometimes have a little bit of it or you don't. I think for me, you know, instinct is almost developed through like success. And so like, you know, your instinct as a jaguar is to pounce on the rabbit. And then when you pounce on it, you eat it and then you're full and you survive. Right. And so it's like, you know, instinct is hard to develop if you can't get the reward of having a full belly at the end of it. 
Um, so the thing is, is for me is, you know, my career was started drop shipping, right? Like that's how, so my instinct was seasoned around, you know, catching trends and having a full belly when I make $10,000 a day or $50,000 a day or a hundred thousand dollars a day. Right. This is how, this is how the belly became full. And so the instinct became sharpened, right? Everybody has the, in, it has some sort of the instinct, but it's like, how can you reward and sharpen it? Uh, at the end of the day, catching a trend is a great way to make money. Uh, and there's, there's, there's amazing ways to do it. I've seen, I've seen some malevolent ways. And, and in that breath, uh, I was watching TV the other day and I saw an infomercial and it was a totally staged Israeli fundraiser. And I totally saw it. I saw it for what it was. I was like, I was like, I've never seen this before, but they were basically asking $25 for a meal. And I was like, this person is making $20 on each meal that these people are donating. You know, like that, that is a malevolent way of catching a trend, for example, or like a, a non-malevolent way was like fidget spinners. Like I friend who brought a fidget spinner, I started flinging it or like catching the jewelry trend when, you know, everyone wanted to look like their favorite rapper and hip hop was on pace to be the America's, you know, biggest genre of music. And that's like a good way to catch a trend or, uh, you know, arbitraging Instagram posts in the midst of a bull when, you know, digital ad space was going through the roof. That would be like a positive trend, but there's also like malevolent trends. Uh, like I just explained. And so it, it just, it's a kind of fascinating to watch. Um, I think, I think, you know, for me, it was just seasoned through reward. Uh, and that's how I guess that tool got sharpened. Uh, and that would be my, you know, at the end of the day, there's huge ways to catch trends. And if you're an internet marketer entrepreneur, then right. you're in the business of catching trends and you should yes. just figure out what the next trend is and get ahead of it. And so, you know, uh, that, that's, my, that, that's, that's the truthful answer on how I've maybe developed the ability to just, I sniff it. I see it now. I've had caught so many <laughs> trends. I can just sniff it and be like, okay, that's a winner. That's going to smack, right? That's going to make a ton of money <laughs> go on to the next. Uh, but this is, this, is a, this is a quality of mine that I'm, uh, you know, it's good for pudgy because like there's products that I can put that make pudgy around that are good for it. But uh you know, I, I like, for example, we we're going to do Bitcoin ordinals and the team told me no. And like, thank God we didn't catch that trend because I didn't think like, I don't think, you know, that ended up, you know, being maybe the most advantageous thing. So these are the things that I think we're focusing on internally uh, is just being just don't let Luca steer us off track with the trend. <laughs> so then I have to ask, what are the trends that you're currently looking at? Yeah, so I'm, I'm working with somebody on it. Just like there's a lot of toy trends that I'm looking at. Right. Because, you know, it's it's easy to put the penguin on. So there's this crazy viral toy on TikTok that I'm working with. The guy owns a company called Monkey World uh, and smokes into a pudgy penguin version. Um, I'm really just looking at like the consumer product trends. And my mind is like, what is viral right now? What is making money and what can I slap a pudgy penguin on uh, to Mm. kind of bolster that? How about Web3 specific? Uh, I think there will be a gaming trend. I think there will be okay. an Asia trend. Uh, I think there will be a cute trend because if you remember, cute this is meta. the part that's like crazy to me. It's like really fascinating how, how a lot of yeah. NFT traders are not catching this, but cute. And I, and I don't say this like, I know it sounds biased because we have the number one cute IP on the blockchain, but like, let's just look at it for what it is. Cute has the highest TAM. It has the highest collector base. It has the highest consumer behavior. I mean, cute, cute IP versus everything else is like, there's cute and there's cool. Like, can't even see cool compared to how much money cute makes. And cute never really had its run. It had its moments, like its two week headlines, right? But it never had its run like the, like the historical provenance or the culture and the streetwear. It never had its run like that. And to me, cute seems obvious. Because if Asia takes to NFTs, they're only mm. going to be buying NFTs. I promise mm. you. It, it is, it is, mm-hmm. they're, they don't even care about the other stuff. And mm-hmm. so I, I think there's a trend in Asia. I think there's a trend in gaming forming. I think there's going to be a trend in cute because there's just no way that doesn't stick when that is the biggest sticker in, you know, right. Web 2. <laughs> like that's the thing that yes. sticks the most. Um, I believe there is a trend of building a real business and no longer, like, I don't think, I would be really disappointed if in the bull market, they send these things to 10 ETH with like nothing. You know what I mean? Like I, I, cause those, the PF, those mints and stuff, they'll, all that stuff will come back. But I, I really hope the space doesn't bring like a nothing burger or good art, good, (laughs) good art to 10 ETH just because it's like good art, you know? 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I hope that doesn't happen. So I, I, I believe that there's going to be a little bit more demand for something real. I think they're going to be like, well, you know, what's your social strategy? Like, where are you? What's the story that you're really telling? And I think Pudgy Penguins is helping shape that trend. Uh, I believe as we get more successful, people are going to, you know, look at like how they looked at Bored Ape. Like, remember, things used to have just used to be a monkey right. and they would get 10 ETH just because it was a monkey and, you know, the right. hopes of it being a Bored Ape. Uh, I hope I hope people look to Pudgy Penguins and be like, well, they're, cl they're clear leaders in the space. And so if we want to succeed, we've got to do what they're doing, which ultimately is just nothing but a net positive. It means more products in the world, more content more top of the funnel awareness, which is only going to help the entire industry. You bring up the point of the funnel. I've seen you've spoken a lot about this. You've even drawn out an infographic for the community you that you called the NFT value accrual funnel that explains how you fill out the top of funnel with awareness, whether that's your Instagram, TikTok posts, GIFs, billions of impressions you got on Jiffy, uh, which then brings people down into the toy ecosystem, which then brings them to mint an NFT. And finally, you get the Pudgy Penguin. Let me ask you something. Have you seen yet someone who has who has never interacted with NFT Twitter, who has never been on OpenSea, buy a Pudgy, Pudgy Penguin because they saw you from the top of funnel? Yes, but there's a couple instances. You can go to our Discord and just search it. Uh, but something along the lines, go to Pudgy Penguin Discord and be like, I saw this on Instagram. And, uh, you know, and I, I went down the rabbit hole and I now I own a little pudgy. Uh, so it, it works, but it's really going to work when the tides of the NFT space are in our are in our favor. I mean, it's going to work in a way that I think, you know, because it's you, I'm not trying to push them over right now either. Right. Like I that's not the intent. It, it'll naturally organically happen. The intent right now is just get that familiarity and get that credibility. And really, I should rephrase that funnel because that funnel is not only the NFT value accrual funnel. Call it the collectible valuable value accrual funnel because I think it's relevant to any collectible, whether it's a sneaker, whether it's a Star Trek or Star Wars or a Pokemon. It, I just say NFT because then it just like it wakes people up and educates them on exactly like what's going on, and 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 they can smell the roses. But I think ultimately, it's an NFT. Uh, or a collectible value value accrual funnel, which is ultimately important if you want to build a, a strong collector base, right? How many people would you say have so far made it to the bottom of this funnel? Are we talking? In the, it's not that much. Did you, two say, I would probably say that I know of like ten, probably probably realistically mm -hmm. fifty to a hundred. Now that now that it, it's different. These are like these are like non crypto native people. Now, if you want to make an argument of what does that do for people who do have a MetaMask and people who do have NFTs? I would say close to a thousand, right? Because it's, it's not only meeting all new people who have no idea what NFTs are. It's also meeting people who do know, who do hold NFTs, who wake up and smell the roses and is like, dude, why do I hold all these other NFTs and I don't own a pudgy? Because look at this, everything that's transpiring here. I go to my local Walmart. I see this thing in my face. My mom texted me the gifts and my girlfriend texted me the gifts. It's on my Explore page. It's all over my Twitter timeline because, you know, yeah. they're making banger announcement after banger announcement. So you kind of just season it that way. Uh, and then I think ultimately, it, it, you know, that it converts that, you know, that's really what's helping us today. Right. Why we're like the best performing NFT project in the market is, is that's what's doing it. But ultimately, it's going to have a huge effect uh, when the market turns. OK, got it. So then I have a question for you. And this is, uh, this is internet marketer to internet marketer. You obviously understand the value ladder that you take a consumer through. Perhaps start off with a free product, low ticket product, medium ticket product. And then finally, this is where the big money is made. You have a high ticket product. This is the complete stack of value that you can offer a consumer to change their life. Now for you, what interested me, what I thought was most interesting is at the bottom of your funnel, the high ticket product, which is a five ETH Pudgy today, most likely during a bull market, more than that. However, with your high ticket product, you're only operating at a 5% profit margin. That is the royalty that you get on these Pudgies if you do. Explain that to me. How does that make sense to you? And how would a potential, because businesses will always, 
lean towards efficiency. The most efficient business model always ends up winning. So how does it make sense for you for your high ticket product to only be at 5% profit margin when your competitor or someone in the Web2 business model could be making that with a 100% profit margin? You know, to really under, it's a fascinating question. I think to really understand it is, I'm in the, right now, pudgy penguins is our Mickey Mouse. And if we succeed 10 years from now, right? Like it is the anchor to my entire ecosystem. But five years from now, we might hire, you know, half of Marvel's team and we want to go make a Marvel character, right? Hmm. I'm not looking, I'm looking at just winning right now. Like my focus is not margin. It, it's because the beauty of this space is you have an NFT that's defined by market cap, right? I, I can always go like if I have a half a billion dollar market cap of my NFT, I can go raise from venture at a half a billion dollar valuation. Right. So if my NFT is at a 30th floor price, that's honestly what I'm opt because I can go raise the money from venture. I don't need to go take the money from the community. I just go raise for venture. And also ultimately they value me as a tech company because I partly am. And so I don't need to necessarily, you know, that that's why it matters. So it's like it's like a catch 22 because you're right. Like on its face, I agree with you. Right. It's like, ah, oh, shit. Like. You know, and, and it's on, and it's honestly freaking 0.5%. No one's paying 5%, you know, and, and if you are, thank you. You know what I mean? But it's 0.5% realistically. So when you look at it for what it is, it's, uh, it's pretty sucky, but ultimately <laughs> it creates, it creates an anchor that I can go raise money on. Right. And it ultimately creates an anchor that gives us credibility so that if we want to go do a cool and exclusive universe, you know, five, 10 years from now, we can't. Right. And then you then you build it out like to say that all pudgy pe- like the igloo company is going to be pudgy penguins for the next 10 years. Well, if we fail, then it probably will. And, and like but like there's going to be a certain milestone that we hit in which I think to myself, well, we have a responsibility to the company and to the shareholders and honestly to the holders to expand this. Because there's a, there's a subsegment of people that love everything that Pudgy Penguins is doing, but they just do not resonate with the cute. Now, I would think that's strange because I would, I would say I would argue look at it fundamentally and, and stop getting – some people are too emotional with the pretty picture on the other side of it. But mm. at some point, you have to look at, you know, if I want to bring new people in, not everybody resonates with cute. Right. So right. there's 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 a new universe to be formed and there's collaborative universes. But I can't even I'm not even remotely. I mean, that's so far down the line. I can't even think about that until this ultimately becomes our Mickey Mouse. Right. Because we're the igloo company. We're a take on the Walt Disney yes. company. And the Walt Disney company wasn't just Mickey Mouse. It was a plethora of things. Right. But I don't even get there. Yeah. Right. It's like Yuga Labs, like Yuga Labs now has Codas and other side. And, and, and there's this whole universe that they're making. And that's so cool. Right. I, I have to fir- first mo- focus on making our pudgy penguin our board ape. And then once our pudgy penguins are board ape, we either add new characters to the world. Obviously, I have milestones that I want to hit. Like, uh, I don't have a movie or a TV show that I'm not even focused on anything else. Like there's uh, there's Walmart was just the beginning. I've got many barriers to break here. But, you know, if you're looking at it from a five to 10 year horizon, you know, to say that, like, when I'm 30, that the Igloo company doesn't have a new universe a part of it. Like it probably does. It, it, I mean, I hope it does. Cause if it does, that means we would have achieved in making pudgy penguins or Mickey mouse. And if pudgy penguins are Mickey mouse and our community loves us, our holders love us, everyone loves us. Right. Uh, but it's just about first I, I kind of work chronologically. Like how do I make this work in the short term? You're right. There's some pain there because it's like uh, 0.5%. Like I'm, I, everything in the business, by the way, I optimized for that, for that NFT, right? I optimized for its success. I believe that it's the anchor to our collectible market. It's the anchor to our reseller market. And if that fails, then I think the brand ultimately fails. I'm just a firm believer in that. And so it's hard, but it's again, sacrificing short-term gratification of a higher margin, high ticket item on the bottom of the funnel for long-term joy, which is a universe of characters. Right. And then, you know, any new character that we launch or universe that we launch, you can you can make sure that it's just nothing but additive to the core ecosystem. Uh, But a long, a long ways to go before I even start thinking that and a lot of more milestones and accomplishments we have to hit before we even start going there. Well, in only two years, you guys have made it through the the biggest gatekeepers, Walmart. A lot of companies would dream like the ultimate goal for some companies is like we this is our roadmap to make it into Walmart. And from there, we've made it. You guys have accomplished that in two years. 
what's next? Obviously, you can't give Alpha. I'm sure you have a lot of conversations happening behind the scenes. But uh, if you can start painting a picture, what do the next phases of well, Eagle the Company immediate look next, like? The immediate next phase is making sure Walmart's a success. Because I'll tell you what the bigger announcement with Walmart is. The bigger announcement, I'm telling you this now, Leon. If and when Walmart makes a second order and more doors, right, hopefully nationwide, it changes everything. Because it's one thing to break through the door. It's a one thing to, to get an invitation back and to build a relationship. If and when we get back into Walmart again, we will unequivocally be blockchain, crypto, Web3, NFT's first ever mass market brand. And that announcement is bigger than a launching in Walmart, in my opinion. It is, it is arguably top three biggest announcements in NFTs ever made ever. Because what you have is, is you have, you have success. They're only reordering if it's, if they found success. And that I think is not to be underestimated. Um, I believe after that, you know, it's, it's really getting and telling the story and pudgy world. I mean, I'm not, I can't give you the alpha, unfortunately. But it's, it's how do you just make this thing bigger, better, more known, more emotionally attached? How do you just take this, kick this thing up notches? And if you can kick this thing up notches, uh, we'll be good to go. For the Walmart thing, are you on track for that? I feel like we're on track, yeah. Do they give you clear KPIs? Like they give you clear KPIs. And based on today's KPIs, we're on track. Okay, this is beautiful, man. Have I got time for a final question for you? You got time for a final one. So a big part of what happens in Web3 is as we go, we are shaping the industry. A big conversation that was happening last year was our NFT holders, shareholders and the company. Mm. And the community has unanimously agreed through conversation, debate, fudding, projects failing and not that this, the case is not NFT holders are not shareholders in a, in a company today. The question that the community is asking itself is what is the value that a brand is responsible for offering its holders? I have a situation, a scenario for you. Let's say holders of a community receive a free airdrop. The whole community receives a free airdrop, free product. That airdrop happens to resell on secondary to $20,000. Someone buys it for $20,000. Is the original brand that launched a free product are they responsible for offering the value equivalent to a free product or that of $20,000 that someone bought it speculatively? It's a great question. I think first and foremost, you have to make sure that everything that you do, uh, you have empathy for everybody who buys. The, you always have to optimize for the highest sale and you, you can never disregard that. Now, the truth mm -hmm. of the matter is, is people are in charge of their own buying decisions and they buy it for their own reasons. When I spend $10,000 on a sports card, I am buying it for a reason. And that a reason can be a multitude of reasons. And so when you make big purchases like that, just hope that you are making it under the guise that you know why you're buying it and what you're looking for. And that if it goes below a certain price, you sell it. And if it goes above a certain price, you sell it. Or if you just love it because of the emotional attachment or the pretty picture, you keep it. Uh, people need more accountability on their self actions. No one forces anybody to buy it. I optimize for my first believers and my early collectors, that's who I optimize for, first and foremost, above all else. What happens on the secondary, I can't control. I can only control what I can control, and I will control what I can control to the best of my ability. Some people will be upset at that, but ultimately, you know, the, the part that's important to me is aligning expectations. That I think is, you know, people mm -hmm. like speculation because it just goes like this, right? I like this. I like that. That's what I like. I like a steady grind up. I don't need to be at a 50th floor tomorrow. I don't need to do that. I don't need to be right. I, I'm here for the long game. I, I've showed my integrity. I know where I stand in this business. And you've seen just people have meteoric rises, but somebody always gets burned on the other side of that. And so like the situations where I can imagine, you know, those airdrops happening. And I, I like, I look back to a lot of those scenarios. It was because the team didn't or didn't align the expectation correctly. Right. It was just, mm. you know, speculate to speculate, but I will always align the expectation. Like, for example, you know exactly what you're getting when you buy a pudgy penguin, whether it's at five ETH, at one ETH or at 10 ETH, you know exactly what you're buying. Like there's no reinvention of what you're buying. And if we succeed, you could probably assume 
you know, what will come next. But at the end of the day, you get what you're buying. You, you know what you're getting. And that's what I actually think we do the best. I think that's why you've never seen a cataclysmic moment against us because we've always tried to align the expectation. We've had a little hiccup with these fishing rods, but I didn't make those fishing rods. I'm just trying to make those things as valuable as I can or, or as, as useful as I can, I think is the better word. Um, and so, you know, from my perspective, uh, I think there's, there needs to be a better take on accountability just in general, whether it's stocks, whether it's crypto. I saw Chamath get blazed the other day for a SPAC run. I personally lost millions of dollars in Chamath SPACs. It is my fault, not Chamath's. You know what I mean? Like there just needs to be a level of accountability across people. And, and I think with that accountability, uh, we will find a lot of success. But ultimately, uh, my responsibility and, and where I give value to, if I, to answer your question clearly, if I give something to our holders for free and they resell it for $20,000, you know, what it resells for, I have no physical control of. Like I just, I, 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 I wish I could. <laughs> if I could, it would be a different, you know, I'd be talking to you from a different spot. You know what I mean? But like yeah. <laughs> I have no control over that. So it's up to somebody on the other side of it who's making an accountable right. buying decision based on their own wherewithal. Uh, to to justify why they're purchasing it. And I hope they have a plan. And I hope that if it hits any trigger on either positively or negatively, that their plan, that they are ready to risk and hedge their bets and, and be smart and fiscally responsible, you know, at the end of the day. And it's my job to make sure that the expectation is clear, that if you are reselling it for that much and you are buying it for that much, that you're not buy, buying it under the false guise of some strange expectation that I was never clear on. Look, I'll say something. Anyone who wants the best for Web3 should want the best for Budget Penguins. Uh, you have, I salute you, my man, for everything you're doing, and you have my full support. Thank you, Leon. I appreciate you. Thank you for having me. Thanks, my man.